How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer, and we got Brian Alvarez here as well. And uh, we're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling here on Wrestling Observer Live. Mick Foley will be joining us in about a half an hour, and uh, we can talk about his book, Tatum Brown, talk about the WWE when he's going to be back on television, how his tour was. He just got back from the U.K., as a matter of fact. And uh, actually, I'm almost done with his book, and got a lot of questions for him on that. But mainly, it's going to be you guys calling, because the last time he was on... Uh, we had so many questions that we took up almost the whole show, so this time it's going to be uh, you guys calling up for Mick Foley. You can call us at 1-800-878-PLAY, but all lines are busy right now. Brian, how are you doing? Uh, I'm here. <laughs> what does that mean? I, uh, in the introduction, so I almost didn't make it. Wow, wow. So how's your week? So you... got lost. Oh, oh, so now, are you at, where are you at tonight? I'm at the Elks Lodge again. Milwaukee, the Oregon? Monthly, uh, yeah, the monthly show here. Okay. So, yeah. Oh. You made it. Oh, that's good. Um, Hulk Hogan's no longer in the WWE, at least for a little while. Yep, yep. Uh, what was your reaction when you uh, heard that news? My reaction was, I remember when they first started doing the Mr. America thing, I liked it so much because it was so campy, and I really enjoyed a lot of what they did with it. And then, like, he was gone. And it's all over, and they did an angle to wrap it up on uh, Thursday night on SmackDown, and it was like, okay. Boy, that was a weak finish, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, all that build, and that was the end. He unmasked. Yeah. He got fired. Yeah. But what can you do, you know? Yeah, and uh, Roddy Piper, also gone? Yep. Yeah, in the same week. I don't, actually, I think that that's the best for all concerned anyway. Um, yeah. And Hogan's going to end up being back, and I think everyone knows that anyway. Yeah, and I think we talked a lot last week about Piper and how I'm sure he knew he was done, and probably uh, Hogan had a pretty good idea as well from uh, some of his interviews leading up to uh, that announcement. So You know, Hogan, I, the, one, the one, one thing about Hogan that has come across as far as internally in the company, um, as far as uh, with a couple of the wrestlers and everything, and not just wrestlers, but people in the office, um, it, it really hurt his, this this leaving hurt his rep in the sense that he, you know, left over among, you know, the, the prime thing, the, the complaint about the payoff. And it's yeah. like every wrestler in that company knows that he got paid a whole lot more than they did, with maybe, oh, yeah. with maybe like the exception of Vince McMahon and maybe Kurt Angle, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and he's out there, you know, it, it kind of, you know, he's, he's booked for all these things, and, and he's agreed to stay at least through SummerSlam, and he doesn't like a payoff on a show that everyone knows, you know, did well below expectations. And he decides to leave. And he was the main event. He was the guy who, you know, was the guy who would would have been credited had that show done well, and who got would have gotten the blame had the show done poorly. And uh, decided, I guess, that he thought the blame was unfair and the payoff was unfair. So maybe Hogan knew something about vengeance or had some predictions. <laughs> I guess so. As official as it's going to be, this you know, this far in advance, uh, it looks like we're going to get Triple H and Bill Goldberg as the main event at SummerSlam in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and I believe it's August. 24th, although that date might be wrong, but it's, uh, uh, actually, the date isn't wrong. That is the date. Okay. So anyway, um, that's going to be a very interesting match because it's a match that neither guy, there's, there, there are great arguments on why both guys should win and why both guys should lose. And, uh, um, and how long? And in how long? And, um, Boy, that's good. I just think that the week before and the day of that show and the day after that show are going to be very interesting. Oh, I think that between now and August, it's going to be very interesting because, uh, I mean, whether or not, you know, let's just say the main event is, is for sure. And it, 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 it's not for sure this, this time out, you know, this far out, yeah. because Vince McMahon changes his, his, his uh, direction on a dime regularly. But assuming that he made mention of it tomorrow, uh, that would leave two months for every game in the world to be played. Well, it's uh, going to be played whether he announces it or not, because people people are aware of it now. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that'll be fun to watch on TV, because, uh, you know, whether they announce the match or not, the one thing that, like you said, will not be certain until the day of the show is who's going over. So uh, No, even even if, even if we hear a week before, it will not be certain until... It will mean until, nothing. It will mean nothing. That's right, because there's going to be games yeah. played until the very end. Uh, Randy Couture and Tito Ortiz have a unification match for the... UFC Light Heavyweight Championship that's going to be on September 26th in Las Vegas. They had a press conference this week, on uh, Wednesday, and at the press conference they, in fact, did not announce a building or where or when tickets would be on sale, but uh, they did announce the match, and I guess they just wanted that out uh, as quick as they could because it was, um, I guess, the day yeah, after. 
Did there they... are many buildings bidding for it. Maybe there are. I don't know. That is a really intriguing match, and it's a really hard one to pick. Not at like, not not like every UFC match isn't hard to pick, but boy, this one's really hard to pick. You know, the thing is, I always, I always don't pick Randy, and Randy always uh, amazes me. And Randy, amazes Randy me. always wins when he's the underdog. Now he's yeah, the underdog again in this one. I'm thinking about this match, and I'm just right now my pick would be Tito. You know, if they were both 28 years old, and my pick is Randy for sure. Um, Randy's 40. Then again, he hasn't looked 40 in a lot of his fights. No, he has not. And um, he certainly didn't in his last fight. That is a really tough one to pick. Um, you know, Tito's been doing a movie, so I mean, as 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 much training as he can probably do. You know, Randy's probably trained harder. Although the last, you know, the training in the last six weeks is really what counts, and Tito will train. Incredibly hard. Um, you know, Tito's younger. Randy's got more guts. And in a tough fight, the guy with more guts, uh, you know, um, yeah. you know, has ha has the edge in that Tito doesn't like to. Neither nobody likes to get hit, but Tito folds quicker. Now, Tito, again, but again, Tito is younger, and Tito is a really skilled fighter. Yeah. And, and uh, it's a boy. It's a tough one. And and. Go ahead. I'll go ahead. Okay. Well, you know, and, and the size, the, the whole thing is, is that Ortiz has been used to being kind of, um, I guess, the, the strong guy in every match he's been in. He's been the be He's never faced a wrestler of the caliber of Randy Couture. Um, you know, he's faced, um, he's faced kickboxers and, and punchers much better, but in every case he's managed to take them off their feet and keep them there, which meant that their kickboxing meant nothing. Uh, with Randy Couture... There's a question on who's going to get the takedowns, um, and they're going to have to fight for them, whoever's going to get them. Standing up, um, Tito, I think, is quicker, but Tito doesn't like to get hit. And, you know, Randy out outboxed Chuck Liddell, who Tito was afraid of. So, it's again, <laughs> it's, it's, well, we'll have a lot to say about that one as the weeks go on. Yeah. The one thing when I listened to the press conference was uh, I was listening to Tito, and everybody who asked him a question was asking about ducking Chuck Liddell and everything like that. And we've obviously been following that for months and months now, and I think pretty much everybody assumed that he was. But Tito did such a good job that I almost believed his entire story. The first thing Except that it wasn't true. And then he had these <laughs> commitments, and then he was, couldn't train because he was filming for this movie. And he was so good that I was like, wow, he's making a strong case. Yeah, but you know what really, you know what really killed it was when... Um... I think it was Jeff Merrick, actually, who asked about uh, the comment about uh, maybe we're going to take that match to Japan. And then yeah. they were trying to say, oh, well, they meant that you know UFC was going to do a show in Japan headlined yeah, by that. Yeah. When I heard that, it was just like, oh, okay, you guys, you're, 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 now you're insulting my intelligence, and you've gone too far. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that they knew that Jeff knew because they were really, they didn't sound like they wanted to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they wanted to talk to anyone. That was, that was kind of embarrassing as a press conference, I mean, as far as like, because all the questions, you know, is for, for this for Tito were all about Chuck Liddell. Yeah, it was almost like the Linda McMahon conference when that one guy called in and they immediately got rid of him. But it was like an entire call full of that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we we avoid it. Yes. Um, what do you think of Zach Allen's debut on Thursday? His first match on Thursday, anyway. I mean, first match that WWE fans would have seen. Um, when I first heard that it was going to be that particular match, I thought. This is the most horrible idea I've ever heard of in my whole life. But I think that the way that it ended on TV, I almost think that it was a success. So I think it was a success, but on the wrong night. They should not have yeah. done that match on a night where they where you know that the audience is going to be low because they spent all these months building up this guy's debut, and they do it on a night where you know it's probably one of the lowest you know. And I and the final rating is not, but I would assume it's going to be one of the five lowest rated SmackDowns in history. Yeah, and it's not the fault of the main event; it's the fault of the night. And, and of all the, uh, you know, of all the matches they could have booked him in, this was pretty much a miracle the way it turned out. Yeah, it was put together real well. I love that one where um, Big Show, in all of his plumptitude, I, I, don't, I don't think there's such a word, but... Um, there is now. Yes. So, you know, went up to Stephanie McMahon and, and made her look just so small and thin. I thought that exact same thing. I mean, he looked so huge and fat as he was doing that ogre thing on Stephanie McMahon, and, and she's doing that. <laughs> that, was, yeah. that was tremendous, though. I could not help but think that she had to have written that whole segment right there. 
where I'll be in a hall and Big Show will obscure the entire hall. Because <laughs> everyone's always talking about, God, Stephanie looks so big. And all of a sudden they do this angle and she looks like just tiny, just tiny woman. Yes. <laughs> Man of the big show. Oh, my God. And... So she actually knows the lesson of size and no one else in the company does. Obviously, Vince Russo didn't on Wednesday. That's true. Yeah. Uh, Kane, uh, bald head, no, uh, exactly. no more burns. I, I take back everything I wrote about uh, how this could possibly be success. <laughs> he was so less terrifying with the shaved head and, yeah, it, he's doomed. Yeah, the other thing on the, on, the, on the WWE, remember a couple weeks ago we were praising them? About how the, um, you know, like the week that they had the two Madison Square Garden shows, how they had the lineups in advance, and, you know, everything was, was you know, so well built up. And now here yeah. we are in uh, Montreal and Toronto this week for uh, Raw and SmackDown, and we don't know anything. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing's been, nothing's been said whatsoever. Although uh, Eric Bischoff will not be there tomorrow, and uh, Steve Austin will be back tomorrow, and I guess it's Steve Austin's yes, revenge. That that's, that's like, you know, I hate those kind of things where they do that one week and then the other one the other week. You know, they yeah. used to do that in the past. I never liked it. I didn't particularly like Raw. I thought SmackDown ended up being all right, kind of slow at the beginning. Um, the tag team title change where uh, Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas beat Eddie Guerrero and Tajiri, that was that was a really good match. Yeah. And the the final segment, you know, I mean, for what it was, I thought it was a successful I thought it was a successful segment. The place went crazy. So the show ended on a good note. The last half hour, 45 minutes were all right. Uh, it was kind of boring up until that point. There's something about the angle where Eddie was upset because of his car that I just loved. Oh, yeah. I, 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 He's looking so sad as the jury's lying on this broken windshield. And then he goes and, and looks at him off. Yeah. My car. <laughs> my, that was great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess that means we're going to get some Eddie, Eddie Guerrero and jury matches. Yep. So, And I don't know where they go from there, but uh, I guess we will find out. Chava will be back. Not that soon. Not until September. Well, the rate they're going with one pay-per-view, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, 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 at, the, at the house shows, they were hooking Eddie with uh, Sean O'Hare. So, he's, so uh, I mean, at least that's what I saw over the weekend. So we'll see where that goes. You know, the thing I don't understand, I, I always look at the house shows, and I just look at how I had to try to learn how to wrestle, and that was to be in the ring with someone who knew what they were doing. And I just look at these house show lineups and, It'll be like Maven will be in the ring with Mark Jindrak or something like that. and Or they'll take someone and they'll team him with somebody who's experienced. And I always think, okay, why don't you have them wrestle with the person who's experienced? It should be Eddie Guerrero versus Sean O'Hare every single night for like uh, six months. And then Sean O'Hare will be good. It's not Sean O'Hare teaming with Eddie and facing like Mark Jindrak and Maven or whoever. Well, I don't know that we'll do that, especially because they're on different rosters. But, uh, I, but I do know what you're saying. You just got to work against good guys, and I always see these tough enough guys wrestling tough enough guys, and I don't understand it. Yeah. Uh, my, my figure four story of the week is, last week you were talking to me about feeling bad about uh, when I read it, and, of course, I told you that, you know, oh, it's no big deal, and things like that never happen. And so guess what happened yesterday when the mail came? And everybody's in a bad mood at the house, and I come back from the from the uh, post office, and I got my figure four, and I sit down, and everyone's yelling and screaming, and I just tune it out, and I start reading about your article about um, Jamal being fired, which is a spoof of, of Jamal being fired. It's not like we're making fun of that 350-pound man being fired. Um, but it was he wrote a really funny story about it, and I'm just cracking up, and people were not amused by the fact that I was having a good time when nobody else was having a good time. And Oops. So. Maybe I should send five. What? Maybe it's five issues, one for everybody. <laughs> she probably should. What, for the dogs, too? Yeah. I don't that many people living in the house. All right. I did get uh, a couple of orders the other day, and I noticed that they were, like, from three people in the same home. All ordering? I never get anybody like that. I was very amazed by that one, so. I would be, too. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever works for you. Yes. Anyway, we are going to go to uh, Mike in Kelowna, British Columbia, which I think is going to have a SmackDown taping next month, correct? Yeah, we sure are. First one ever. Yeah. Now, you had, you, it was a Nitro or Thunder that was there? Uh, we had a Nitro just uh, just a few months before the uh, the whole thing went down. <laughs> yes. I... And, uh, we've had a house show once since yeah. then. Yeah. And that's it. But uh, the house show was very well attended, and I was talking to one of the, uh, the agents, and he said that uh, they were going to look at us more because it was really well attended. We had a hot crowd, so we're pretty excited about that. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty good. That's I guess in Kelowna that's going to be pretty huge, huh? Yeah, the ticket sales went 
went huge. Um, I, there's less than 100 seats left, and uh, the building holds about 6,000 people. So it's, it's a big deal for us. It made, uh, you know, front page of the sports section. We're pretty stoked about that. I guess the uh, decline in business is, is good for smaller centers like us. So but you, know, you know what's funny is, is, is on that, is, I mean, and, 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 and Kelowna obviously being the, uh, the, the exception, is that, you know, if you look at the schedule that these guys are running, um, they're running a lot of small towns, and I was thinking, I was thinking, well, you know, this is probably the time to do small towns, but they don't draw at all in small towns. And, and, and you know, you would think that it's like something special, like if you come to a New York where, or, or not, New York's probably not a good example either, but let's say San Francisco where there's a million different entertainment things. Not that New York doesn't have them all as well. Um, that a cold product wouldn't be a big deal, but you know, they've been running in a lot of these, you know, B and C cities and doing, you know, 2,000 people as well, and especially like last week in markets where. You know, like Syracuse and stuff, where I just thought they would always be, you know, doing well in. So maybe they need to move to cold cities, like physically cold. Well, oh, Canada. Well, Canada, Canada, summer. Canada always. And then drop. Yeah, Canada always holds up better in declines than the United States does. Like from ninety two to ninety six, I just remember that um, when they would go to Canada, they would not do nearly as poorly as they would do in the United States. And I think that, to a degree, that's the case. Although. Um, they were in, you know, they were the, the uh, SmackDown crew, I think, was in Canada this weekend. And, uh, at, well, at least last night, I don't think they did all that well. London didn't do that nearly as well as it did the last time they were there. Right, that's right. So it's the Raw crew, and they were, that's right, London was was way down, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But um, at, at any rate, we're very excited to have them here. It's going to be it's gonna be good times. I'm going to Raw the one night, and then SmackDown the next night. It's going to be it's gonna be awesome. Cool, cool. Um, the question I have for you, I was at, uh, well, first off, um, love the Wrestling Observer. It's awesome. I'm a I'm a subscriber. Love it very much. Thank you very much. Um, in the in the last uh, yeah, it was last week. You talked about the um, the properties of what WWE owns. Uh, you talked about the movie properties. You said there was um, nothing really there except for uh, producer credits for rock movies and a Stone Cold Steve Austin credit of some sort for a, a direct to video movie or something like that. Um, when we were at WrestleMania, we were right up front and they had a bunch of film cameras there. Yeah. And um, we just got the DVD this week. It just came out here in Canada this week. And Lawler is going off about this WrestleMania the movie thing that they're making. Right. They did it during the show. Yeah. Do you know anything about that? Is it uh, is it still it's, a go? Is that, would that be a movie property? Is it's that... done. Um, I'll actually know a lot more about it um, in a couple of days. But from what I gather, nobody Wasn't wants it. Working on that. What? Wasn't the hottie working on that? Uh, he was. Yeah. He was one of the people working on. It. From what I gather. Um, the, there was not a big market for it in that um, I think UPN and TNN may have both turned it down, but I'm not positive about that. I know one of them did for sure, and I'm, I'll, I'll let you know like what you know which one it was or if both did. But right now there's no they they have a ton of footage and they have no place to air it. And some of the footage apparently is is really good stuff because they did an interview with Steve Austin, which was you know very emotional because it was you know him before his last match of his career. You know, when right before he was actually, you know, taken to the hospital, you know, the day before the show is when they did the interview. And it kind of, you know, it kind of all leads one into the other. Is it more of like a, a beyond the mat type type thing? No, like, no, 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 no. Well, it's not going to be like a beyond the mat because they're doing it themselves. So it's sugar-coated as the WWE, well, I, basically. I, I don't know if sugar-coated is the word because I haven't seen it. It's, I mean, they want it to be a good documentary. They don't want it to be a fluff piece. But, you know, it's not going to be like beyond the mat. And, you know, they're in full control and they're going to make... They're going to make WrestleMania seem like a great thing, and they're certainly, when all is said and done, I'm sure that the end of the movie isn't going to be like, by the way, this show, you know, did a hugely disappointing buy rate. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think that'll make the movie. No, that makes some sense. But uh, at any rate, I mean, the whole weekend was great. It'd be great to have something like that. Um, just curious about it. I, I'm, I'm sure if nothing else, they'll release on video. They filmed so much stuff. I would hope so. Yeah, I guess. You know. One final thing before um, Foley goes on there. Yes. Um, we just did our uh, travel packages for... WrestleMania in New York. Um, if you could just ask Foley if there's been any talk about him coming on there, that would be fantastic. Coming on where? To uh, oh, t uh, any plans for him to uh, show up for Mania in New York? I, I think that there's. Well, well, we'll ask him right now, right this very second, and uh, I think there's probably a pretty decent shot of that. Hey, cool. Okay, okay, Mike. Thank you very much. All right, we've got Mick on the line as well. Mick, how are you? Uh, Dave, I'm doing good. You rescued me uh, from uh, fixing a broken toilet. <laughs> I was just start, I was starting to get aggravated, so uh, so the phone call just came just in time. All right, perfect timing. I guess we should start with the question that we just had, which is, uh, what's your thoughts about uh, being at WrestleMania, doing WrestleMania this year? 
Yeah, I would uh, I would love to be part of it in some respect. Um, I don't I don't know what it would be. I mean, at the very least, I guess I you know could be like their access weekend, and probably at the very most I could you know maybe uh, be in a match. But uh, uh, I I don't know. That's a long ways away. What is it? Six months away? Yeah, we, yeah, uh, yeah, a little more than that. Uh, but I would like to be a part of it in some uh, in some way. I had spoken, you know. Uh, about possibly doing a match at uh, at uh, Mania, and then you know, of course, over the last several weeks, it looks you know like there's a chance to do something before that. But I haven't made up my mind about uh, anything from a wrestling perspective. But uh, now I've read you know in in the multitude of interviews that you've done over the last week all over the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done a bunch of them. <laughs> that uh, some you're not going to wrestle at SummerSlam. I don't think so. Uh, nobody has formally even asked me to, to uh, think about it. And the, the truth is, I mean, I was looking at my schedule today. This is kind of a brutal uh, book <laughs> book tour. I don't, I don't think anybody's ever done something this ambitious as far as book signing. Uh, it's tw- you know, 25 cities. Uh, you know, I started a, a week ago in England, and it goes through the 21st of uh, August. And other days, you know, when I'm not signing, I'll be doing things... Uh, or, uh, promotionally, and I just don't think I could get in any kind of uh, shape. And and nobody that you know has presented me with the opportunity of of doing a match. Also, um, I, I don't know. If, I, I, apparently, I'm not as tough as I used to be because uh, I'm really still hurting from the flight down the stairs. And uh, it, I saw just a knot in my back, and it may be something more substantial. So I don't even know if I'd be uh, ready. You know, not even as far as car, uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint from but from a uh, you know a, a health standpoint either. Yeah. You know I don't think we asked you last time, but how are you feeling in general before you fell down the stairs? Oh well, I was. <laughs> you should you should say how was I feeling before I got involved in Miami? <laughs> I, yeah. I was feeling I, I thought pretty good. You know I mean I had you know uh, some so, some soreness uh, that that you know would be expected after uh, you know having a pretty tough career. But uh, all in all, I, I and I had spoken to the guys backstage because they they wanted to know like what it feels like to to rest up a little bit, and I told them it was it was especially tough to uh, you know to to, to come back uh, in Miami and wake up the next day with the knee swollen and never and everything aching again because I had gotten used when I, I'd gotten used to uh, feeling lousy when I was wrestling so that lousy became normal. And then, uh, you know, after a year and a half, when you when everything starts to ease up a little bit, feeling lousy again is a big adjustment. So this is the what your fifth book? Yeah, this is the, this is the fifth one, and uh, definitely don't want to can have anyone confuse this with a children's book. <laughs> Not at all. You know, the one thing, um, and again, I'm I'm right at the point in the book about page two hundred one where um, um, Andy, who was the the guy who the the seventeen year old, I guess roughly right, is that the age that he's seventeen? Seventeen-year-old who the book is basically about his life um, up to this point has fi- you know has been reunited with his father and he's just found out that his father was a professional wrestler in the South in the sixties and, and in other places as well. You use some of your you know wrestling knowledge and background um, to uh, kind of uh, you know make the father character. Right, right. One of the things that last night when I was reading this thing that really just popped into my head was. When you did the Mankind character, right? I visualized, for some reason I visualized that you, in, in, in doing the Mankind character, you know, kind of like the tragic, you know, Mankind character, you kind of think that he was, you know, growing up abused and all this, that it was this kind of, uh, I mean, did you, did you kind of have an idea of the Mankind character and then use that as, to formulate this book, or is, is or they just kind of, you know, because I, mean, I read the whole book and it wasn't really, or, or you know, I wasn't really thinking about mankind at all until, I guess the uh, the last you know couple of pages that I've been reading of the last you know um, it's just like all of a sudden wow this may be where you get some of the, that that depth of the mankind character. Yeah, it, actually it wasn't, but uh, that's an interesting take on it. I think that's uh, <laughs> part of what's r- really cool about books is that they're uh, you know open to interpretation, and uh, you know I've, I was in England I guess for four days and I had some really pretty astute literary people talking to me about the book and they had come to conclusions that I had never even thought of so it's it's not as if you would be wrong it's just not something I had uh, but I had considered but obviously that kind of uh, and, and I want to make it clear for anyone who picks his book up this has nothing to do with my relationship with my father 
And uh, I wish, I, in a way, that I dedicated the book to him and said uh, to my dad, who is nothing like Tatum Brown. <laughs> um, but I can't, you know, I'm, I guess I'm drawn to that, you know, uh, the 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 the, um, the dark uh, the dark upbringing and uh, you know some problems uh, early in life. And uh, you know, you've you've just gotten to the part, I guess, where things start to get a little ugly, right? I think they've been getting ugly for the whole book. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, like uh, it shocked me when 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 people were. It was Barry Blaustein was one of my pre-readers, uh, the director of Beyond the Mat for guys who listening who don't know. And I handed a book out to like four different people whose opinions I respected. And Barry was the first one to finish. He got back to me and he said, "I." And he'd left a message. I think I was in England at the time doing Robot Wars, and the message was like this haunted message. And he said, "I really, really love it, but it's so dark and." Uh, I'm having trouble sleeping, to tell you the truth. And I thought Barry was crazy. I th I really thought I'd written an uplifting love story. <laughs> well, I mean, there was there were aspects of it where you got there, but then the rug was always pulled. Yeah, yeah, the kid... Uh, well, you're not done reading yet. <laughs> That's true. You know, I just read about the rug being pulled last night. I was getting really sad when um, his the character had this, like, saintly girl who he's chasing after and actually was his girlfriend at one point. And then he, um, and then they have the breakup, and it's just so it's just so sad because it's like, you know, I, I mean, the, the way you wrote the the girl character was like every kid's high school crush combined into one, and and you know, and he was you know this poor pathetic figure who you know every poor pathetic figure like, the the you know it, it was interesting again reading the different characters because um, you you I, I don't know I think that. A lot of things are similar. You know, I, I always relate real well to your books anyway. Um, although they were wrestling books, maybe I should have. But, like, a lot of the different characters, I could sort of relate to them, like uh, the history coach and everything, which, on a, and the, the, the history teacher and football coach, which I want to talk to you about in a second. Sure. But, um, but I mean, I could see, like, every, you know, when a kid growing up in high school, there's the one girl who you, you in, in your mind, dream, she's got these all these saintly qualities, and you actually wrote a girl pretty close to that in the book. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I, th I think it was you know this girl will uh, will you know uh, win a lot of readers' hearts and uh, you know I, w I wish you hadn't told about the breakup <laughs> even though there's more to it than that. Yeah, I think it you know at some point you know she'll break people's hearts and uh, and you know it's interesting when you talk about things get you know getting ugly or being ugly from the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm doing the Today Show. I'm lucky enough to be on a third time and it'll be on. Uh, Wednesday, is Wednesday the 8th, or no, Tuesday the 8th, and the producer called me, because they do a little pre-interview, and she said, you know, don't get me wrong, I really like it, she said, it's just, I've never read anything quite like this, and I said, why is that, she said, it's just when I thought things had to get better, <laughs> they got worse. Well, every time I think that this is the big turnaround, and then there's another, there's another thing thrown out there, that yeah. you go, oh my God, another. Yeah. God. You know what, uh, the, the, uh, the father character to me, uh, and this is, uh, you know, I'd said a little bit, I guess, I don't know how much has uh, aired in the Torch talk, but uh, Wade Keller was asking me about, you know, if it was uh, anything like wrestling or if it was completely different. And I said, to tell you the truth, it's, it's not that much different. And, and I think that, you know, being characters in wrestling, and especially, I guess, because of the, the way I looked, uh, not quite fitting the uh, the norm of what you know pr promoters usually pushed, I think it gave you know gave me an added emphasis to create uh, added incentive to create characters that people could either you know like or dislike, but certainly you know believe in. And uh, and to me, this it, it's not like I wrote it saying okay the dad's going to be a mid card heel, but essentially <laughs> he was like a mid card heel. <laughs> Who, who really teased the big baby face turn and, and ended up, you know, uh, becoming a killer heel. And, and I remember, you know, working with Sting, like, as far back as 92, and, and he said, uh, you know, geez, the character's a little too sympathetic, you know. And, 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 I, and I gave him my big, you know, big analogy about how the, uh, the teacher, you know, if, the t if a teacher has two kids, um, you know, that are bad, but that one kid has the potential to be good, and she gives him extra time and, and attention, and that kid turns around and becomes the heel on her, it will mean a lot more, and the pain will be a lot more uh, uh, more acute than if it was a, uh, you know, the bad kid all along. So I've always been interested in those characters that, that walk a fine line, and I think this dad uh, does it pretty well. 
Now, are you, were you always a history buff? Because there, it, that sort of shows up in certain parts of the book. Yeah, not always. I mean, I went. My my mom found this book when I was seven, uh, where she would mark off books as I read them, and it was like, man, I was doing a lot of reading, and a lot of it was centered around history. And even you know, I, I fourth, fifth grade, I remember you know being a big World War II buff, and that was something I fell out of. And about seven years ago, I got back into. Uh, studying the Civil War, and the Civil War really brought me into civil rights, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, which this book touches on. And then, uh, you know, the Civil Rights uh, ended up uh, working itself into the Cold War, and, uh, and the whole studying about Brent Bozell brought me into that era, you know, of McCarthyism and, and, uh, and, and into modern-day politics. But uh, I, I thought it was pretty interesting history. I mean, I guess you're getting into that right now where I, where I talk about the... Uh, you know the early '60s and the fact that uh, you know they had Negro matches and right. balconies, uh, you know the colored section, and uh, the, the Sputnik Monroe type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and that's why at the end of the book I acknowledge Sputnik Monroe because I think we were just talking about this the last time that uh, when when the time was up. Uh, I had no idea that someone had done the things that that Tatum Brown was doing in this book, so I thought it was only right to you know acknowledge that uh, somebody else had kind of broken that ground now the 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 football coach right and and i don't want you to i actually have some questions for you about the football coach but it'll spoil the books i'm going to ask you some other time okay but but one thing i don't know if if did every school have a coach like that because (laughs) because because i haven't read the book but i can say yes but because it okay (laughs) okay no because i'm reading about this coach right and it's like there are aspects of him. I don't. I didn't. I didn't. I. I didn't. We didn't at our school have a coach exactly like him, but we had a coach very similar. But at a rival school, there was a coach um, who was exactly like him, who ended up, in fact, being arrested, <laughs> almost on identical things. And I just, when I'm reading this, I'm just going like, you know, like I, I, I heard about this. I even kind of lived through this. But I mean. I think that I think that they were prevalent everywhere, but I, but, you know, I didn't know until 20 years later. Yeah, I, I don't know if they were quite as bad as this guy. Quite, quite as. Well, no, 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 not, not quite as bad, but but um, similar. But you know, that was one of the things my mom asked me about, and I have to assume my mother, who the book is dedicated to, didn't like the book. I think she may have found it a little shocking, especially you know, coming from her son. <laughs> I can but, see that. Yeah, the, yeah, and I never even figured that because, like I said, at that point, I still up until. You know, this past month, I still was under the impression that this was a, you know, a sensitive coming of age story, which in a way it is, but it never really hit me that stuff that, you know, that people would find it that, that bad. Maybe, you know, my, my uh, 16 or 17 years in the wrestling world has altered my perception of, you know, what is, what is and isn't normal. <laughs> but my mom was asking me about the coach, almost like, there, there, no, there's no one like that, is there? And I said, well, I, I don't know of one, but I, I said I think that, you know, uh, coaches who are winners and, and athletes who are winners certainly are allowed to play by a different set of rules. And and since that, I've heard a lot of talk about the coach. i tell you the truth, I, I, I thought he was kind of a, you know, a one-dimensional lunkhead, but, uh, but people really like him. And, and, and to tell the truth, when I rewrote the book, I was actually going to make him look a lot more like me, so that if I ever came into a, a movie, that I could be the coach. <laughs> I'd be a, but then you'd have to get gas up. I know. Well, that well, that, if I rewrote it, I wouldn't. I, <laughs> you know, he, I, I was going to say something about a, a prominent set of love handles and, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I could. I still think I could play him if I uh, if I, I could shape up to play the coach. I wouldn't be quite as big as I described him, but I think I could. Uh, you know, you know, get into that character pretty well. I want to go to the phone calls. We're going to start with Alan in Deerfield Beach, Florida. Alan, what's happening? Hi, Dave. How's it going? Going good. Great. I wanted to ask Mick, uh, actually, you stole my question about him coming back, but I'll ask him in, in terms about uh, WCW. What does he think was the downfall of the company? And also ask him about some road stories about him and uh, Max Payne, if he could uh, elaborate. All right. what, what, which three initials did you give me? WCW. Yes. <laughs> oh man. Well, I, Dave, I think you're an hour, right? <laughs> rationalize that. Um, I, you know, I, I think they just, uh, I think they insulted their audience a little bit after you know running, really running that NWO angle um, way past its course. 
And and then I think uh, internal politics really uh, really got the best of them. And obviously that's just a fraction of what went wrong. But you had really good wrestlers who no longer wanted to be there, and and who you know uh, who it was proven could not uh, move up the you know move move up the line no matter how good they were. So I think you just had a lot of people losing interest, and you had the top guys all just trying to stay, you know maintain their spot so they could keep on getting paid. Before I ask the next question, I want to ask you about Max Payne, who our last caller asked about. Um, what are your thoughts about, you know, uh, I know that you guys tag teamed a lot in the WCW days. Yeah, I um, I, I probably consider him a better friend than a great, you know, partner. Not that he wasn't a good partner, but I, I, we never really got the chance to, to get off the ground, I think. I thought it was, a, you know, an, an interesting team, and I thought we had the potential to do some really good uh Promos, but I think uh, you know we were kind of stuck in the first or second match on a, on a pay per view or two, two, and then Max had that you know infamous suplexing of <laughs> Brian Knobs where he nearly killed him, uh, and and I don't know if we teamed up after that. <laughs> that it was uh, it was uh, Sullivan, and uh, and that was kind of my at the end of my run. It just kind of segued from uh, me and Max to me and. Uh, Kevin, but I, I consider him a really uh, a really uh, a good friend, and and I really enjoyed uh, traveling with him. And he was kind of they used to call him MacGyver because it didn't matter what somebody needed, you know, like if you had a flare, you know, like for your car, he'd have it, or he'd have special utensils that could fix about anything. And he was the type of guy that would, you know, if he saw something and he wanted it, he'd buy it without you know pausing to think about what it might be, like a recording studio. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> like a recording studio. And I guess he's producing uh some uh, some albums and i don't know what he's doing but i imagine uh you know he's, he's gonna find something to do well and he was a talented guy yeah you haven't talked to him lately no no and uh i, I it's been a couple of years since i talked to him and I, I think i just spoke to william regal who said he was going to give him a buzz when they went into salt lake city mm -hmm. so he's kind of kept his distance from the wrestling business i think yeah he um he did our show a couple of times he was a, actually a tremendous guest and um yeah, very much into the recording business now. You yeah, know, and, and yeah. videos. You know, he did his, He has his wrestling video that I don't think will ever get released, but um, it's quite controversial to say the least. Oh, oh, the stuff he filmed in Europe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was telling me about that. Yeah, I don't know if it'll ever get released either. <laughs> but uh, Dave, before we take a call, I just want to clear up uh, the the Keebler test rumor that's been floating around. Yes. I read the Observer and it made it seem like I was the, you know, without any questions asked, I was like the Cupid in that relationship. And the, the truth is, I think it's a lot more vague than that. Stacy told me that, and, and I knew she was reading the book when I met her, when I came in in July about the time of, uh, uh, you know, the July pay-per-view uh, a couple of years ago. And what was the name of that? Rebellion or... Uh, Something like that. Rebellion would have been a UK paper. No, not Rebellion. Um, the one where ECW and WC. Oh, Invasion. Invasion. Okay. And so I, you know, I found that pretty flattering to start with. Uh, and then, you know, uh, I, I hadn't seen her or talked to her in the interim period. But as soon as I, uh, she was the first person I saw when I walked back through the doors, which was actually the, the hardest part about returning was actually opening up those uh, double doors backstage. And once I got back there, it was. Uh, you know, it was a really a lot of fun, and she was the first person I saw, um, which made things a lot easier. And then there was Tess scowling behind her, so it wasn't that great after all. But uh, but she told me that she thinks, and she was kind of joking around. She said she thinks that all the the uh, ribbing I did on Tess made her feel sorry for him, so that she was predisposed to liking him. Which is a long way from saying I'm the guy that got them yeah. together, but but certainly I think there could be some uh, some substance to you saying uh, that all the guys in the dressing room are wishing I'd made fun of them in the book. <laughs> but still, even with that being said, I don't think Al Snow had a shot at Stacy. <laughs> now you were mentioning to me in the break about um, now I want to you know as far as the reviews and everything of the book, um, you said like you did very, you know a lot of the critics in in the UK did well. Now in the U, did you notice a difference as far as Perhaps treatment as far as the UK critics and American critics. Um, yeah, I, I do. I, especially when it comes to the ex wrestler aspect of, of you. Definitely. Uh, I think the people in the UK are much more open to the idea that an ex wrestler could write a book that might be good. Whereas over here, it's, it's almost like you're starting, you know, with, you know, in a hole and you have to dig yourself out of it. 
and uh, and so whereas um, and, and I still it, uh, my publicist over there said that she was meeting some resistance in the UK, and then the most respected uh, literary critic. Uh, uh, out there, at least the most respected uh, critic on radio, it was a very prestigious show on the BBC, on their arts and entertainment uh, station. Loved the book, and that kind of gave it a stamp of approval. Yeah, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. And everyone and, can and follow. Everyone, yeah, yeah, and everyone kind of followed suit to where you know the, the you know the publisher, uh, who was a very uh, you know very prestigious person over there, was calling it you know the best debut novel she's seen in, in five years. And what was kind of neat about that is she actually left the party with Bill and Hillary Clinton to come to my dinner. Oh wow! Yeah, and so I, I thought that was it was kind of neat. So, so my name actually came up at the Hillary. You know, when she told Bill she was leaving, and, uh, and she, she had to go to dinner with Mick Foley. So I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Over here, I do get the sense that the people are. It's almost like it reminds me of Brent Bozell, at least a, a couple of. Uh, reviews I've read, where Brent Bozell used to watch our show, but he wasn't watching it to see what might be good about it. He's like over there cherry-picking the bad parts, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And even with that being said, I haven't gotten a lousy review. What I've gotten is almost like a grudging uh, you know, review where they say things like, and while one can't help but admire such strange images as where they say, and while the two main characters are undeniably inter, you know, interesting, and they'll pick on the fact that they'll say, oh, but the peripheral characters are two-dimensional. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, how many books have you know more than a couple of characters that are really well defined anyway? And 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 I, I disagree with that. Um, but but overall, you know, even the one that that got on me the worst concluded by saying. Fans in the mood for vigorous pulp may enjoy it, so you know it's kind of like a a a, uh, a a a real half-hearted endorsement, but it's still an endorsement nonetheless. Do you, do you find it also as far as like getting on the big shows and things like that? Because I know when you did your first books, you know, and, and and nobody had any idea that those would do as well, or the very first one, as well as it did. Right. Um, you know, a lot, I I got the impression that you know a lot of shows, and we talked about it, there were certain shows that would not put you on. Uh, perhaps because you were a wrestler, or for for whatever reason. Yeah, there's still unfortunately a you know a stigma that surrounds wrestling, unless you're like The Rock, you know, who uh, you know has clearly broken through into the mainstream. But I'd say you know you know even Austin met a lot of resistance, even though he was you know like a cultural icon, uh, you know, back in '98, '99. I mean, Triple H has a real tough time getting any kind of mainstream publicity, and you know he's been the the, the heavyweight champion. Uh, several times, but uh, the second book, we were meeting a lot of resistance, and when the New York Times article came out, it was like the floodgates opened up, mm -hmm. and it seems like uh, just as in the UK they needed uh, you know, a stamp of approval from that one literary critic, that the New York Times was like a big stamp of approval, letting other mainstream show, shows know, okay, it's, it's okay to have this guy on, so... You know, at the same time that, you know, I've, I've taken a couple of beatings, and not even real major beatings from some of the real high, highbrow critics, which is a little different than, a, you know, a, a major newspaper who would, I think, be a lot more uh, uh, a lot more lenient on my past. Um, but at the same time, I've taken a couple lumps. You know, there's thousands of books that are published every year, and, and you know, 99% of them don't get, you know, near the attention that this one does. So, uh you no, know, it's it's a little bit of give and take, and I think I actually come out ahead on the deal because, like I said, I've got the Today Show um, in a couple of days, and and an um, uh, article in USA Today and uh, Entertainment Weekly. So, just those three, even if nothing else else comes up, would be a lot more than most books get. Did you at any point, either whether it would be with your publishers or even yourself, go like, you know, this is a risk. You know, you you have a great track record. And now you're going into uncharted waters because your wrestling book sold primarily among wrestling fans. Even though I thought that you know your your books, I, I think that your your books to a degree probably sold to a, a little bit among people who weren't wrestling fans just because it kind of became a hot book. But with with this one, it's like yeah, you're going to have some wrestling fans. You're going to have wrestling fans buy it. That might even be your core audience. But for it to be you know a success, you're going to have to make it to an audience that isn't even. That, that might know who you are, but that they're not enamored with you in the same way as as I, I would think. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was definitely a risk. Uh, even the you know the idea of of writing it was 
was risky, let alone try, you know trying to you know sell it to the public. And I actually had a good offer from Judith Regan that I didn't take just because I didn't know if I could actually write a book. Judith uh, made me the offer back when I said I wanted to write one, so uh, I actually wrote you know wrote the book without any kind of uh, guarantee whatsoever. And then we shopped it around, and it's funny because some people got it, you know, and then there were others that were like, well, can't the father be a good guy? And it just kind of reminded me of wrestling in the sense that. You know, uh, sometimes people think that you know the um, the popular way is is the only way, and that somebody you know with a little different style, uh, or you know, in my case, somebody with a little different look couldn't couldn't make it. So it is a it is a risk, and and there is a chance, uh, you know, because it is. You know, I was mentioning that one one reviewer gave me a, a great review, and she uh, she said it was a uh, a strange mix of J D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. And Brett Ellis Eason's American Psycho. So you might look at that and say, "Well, God, we're going to get everybody then. We're going to get people who like sensitive, thoughtful books. We're going to get like people who like violent, sickening books. Or you might not get any of them because there might not be enough of uh, of, of either. So I, I don't know. It's a it's a, it's a risk. And I am hoping that some um, you know wrestling fans buy it. Which is, uh, if you don't mind me plugging this, uh, just in case you know we don't get back to the book at all. Uh, I, on the mickfoley.com, I actually picked out uh, several selections uh, from the book and introduced them, gave them some introductions so people would know where I'm coming from. They kind of show the wide range of emotions from the unique father-son relationship to the kind of sensitive relationship with the girl to the weird sex to the sickening violence. There's a nice flashback, Dave, that I think you'll like, uh, you know, dealing with this guy's wrestling days. And uh, and, and as well as that... Uh, Besides that, I'm also going to be doing a tour diary, so if people want to keep up with what I'm doing on the road, they can log on to mickfoley.com. Okay, great. We're going to go to Jeff in New York City. Jeff, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? I'm going to speak to you, fellow Long Islander, Mick. Um, All right. I have, two, I have two questions for you, Mick. Um, I've heard you on other radio shows when people ask you about Triple H, and you kind of, uh, you know, with all due respect, take the, take the political route. You don't want to comment, obviously, due to the... To his brass, but I'm curious if you'd be so kind to comment on how you feel about his reign so far, and do you think he should drop the title? Uh, yeah, you're right. That's, that's a question I don't feel comfortable all answering. <laughs> uh, because, you know, people can look at Triple H in a, a couple of ways. You know, they can look at him, uh, you know, almost like a, a San, you know, Sandy Koufax in baseball, where, you know, some people would say, well, Koufax didn't have the, you know, the, the length of career to be one of the all-time greats. In other words, we'll say he had four of the best uh, seasons of all time. He has to be considered one of the all-time greats. So by some standards, Triple H has drawn more money than any heel in the business ever. I mean, by some standards. And then there are other standards that say, you know, well, he has not uh, had a, a, you know, a program that has clicked with the public in the past year. And I would say there's some truth to both sides of the story. Um, but I just think that title was a mistake from the beginning. Uh, I mean, they showed a flashback. I think it was on uh, Confidential I was watching last night, which was a repeat. And they had Bischoff handing that title to Hunter. And it was just, it was like the wrong heat, you know. It was like, uh, it just just didn't sit right with me. And uh, I think that they should have made the Brock Brock Lesnar's uh, WWE Championship uh Mean mean more, so uh, I don't know. It's a, you're right. It is a political, <laughs> it's a tough political question to to field, especially because you know I made my best money with Hunter, and I have all the respect in the world for him as a performer. But uh, you know he has had a couple programs that have not captured the uh, the you know the the minds of the fans this year. No, I, I can see where you I can see where you're going with that. Um, my other question is about uh, Cheatham Brown. Um, I'm wondering if I know you kept in mind it was it was it was written for a reader, not a pro wrestling reader. But with a pro, well, in your opinion, do you think the pro wrestling fans who pick this book up, do you think they'll they'll get more of what you're trying to say as opposed to someone who's not familiar with pro wrestling, and they'll and at the at the, at the end of reading the book, they'll come out with a different perspective. I don't think they'll really come out with a different perspective. I think they may especially enjoy, you know, uh, the section of the book that explains, uh, you know, the wrestling background. And this was something I, you know, I talked with for several hours with uh, Terry Funk, uh, Harley Race, and Robert Fuller about. And I think that wrestling fans especially will find that era of the business to be uh, fascinating. But I also think that non-wrestling fans 
would enjoy it because I don't think they've ever looked at wrestling as thinking it has any historical significance whatsoever. Um, at one point, it was a lot more wrestling heavy, and it's kind of a shame, you know, for the sake of the wrestling fans that about 20,000 extra words uh, didn't make it because uh, for wrestling fans, it may have been fascinating, but at that point, it became a wrestling book, and it would have been it would have been kind of boring, I think, for non-fans. But who knows? You know, maybe we could work something out with the, uh, you know, the Observer, uh, where we might be able to print certain sections, uh, because I think uh, a lot of the uh, listeners would find it really interesting. Yeah, Tatum Brown will be available at all bookstores on Tuesday. It's his first novel. There is some wrestling. In fact, uh, was, the part I'm reading right now has to do with wrestling, and it's it's kind of like uh, '60s uh, Southern territories and. Some interesting stuff, actually. Um, you know, we talked about the civil rights movement being at that same time frame. Um, and uh, so I think some people will get kind of a kick out of uh, some of those stories that were taken, I, I guess, from different wrestling stories where he had talked to other wrestlers. And Robert Fuller gets his name in the book, as I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, at one point, uh, Terry Funk was in the book, and Danny Hodge was actually a, a, a significant character. Not that he had any speaking lines, but... Uh, the, I, I remember talking to Harley Race a couple of years ago and asking him, you know, about, you know, bitter light heavyweights who, you know, really resented the fact they never uh, made that kind of money, uh, you know, the big guys would. And so Harley was uh, was really helpful. And, uh, you know, you see a lot of bitterness uh, in the business because everybody thinks to some extent that, you know, they should have a better, uh, you know, a better run than they do. And especially, I would think, you know, guys... Uh, you know, legitimate, uh, you know, shooters or hookers, and in this case, you know, a guy who was uh, trained in Wigan and, uh, you know, was about as good as they come. Uh, in the original story, the one guy that he couldn't take was Danny Hodge. <laughs> That's the one guy, you know, that stood in the way of making any kind of money, and so he just resented it. You know, he had a real, uh, real hatred for football players and a real hatred for Texans based on a, uh, based on meeting, <laughs> dealing with. Terry Funk and Amarillo. <laughs> but that, that, that didn't make the final cut. But like I said, uh, you know, it's, I think it's pretty good storytelling. It just, it just, you know, ultimately didn't, you know, fit in. But you know, like I said, uh, maybe we could make that available for you know big wrestling fans down the road. Yeah. Let's go to Ed in San Antonio. Ed, what's going on? Speaking of Texas. Hey Dave. Um, hey Nick. Um, I can't explain to you how big of a fan I am of yours. Um, you really inspired me. Uh, Thank you. And the, the question that I have for you is, um, I, I've heard many times that you said that you don't really have an interest in being a booker or being part of creative. Uh, I've always thought that you would be pretty good at it, just from all the stuff that you've done in, in your career. And my question for you is, if you were given the, the job of head of creative, and who would you bring in to be your, your brain trust? Who, would, who do you think you would elevate to be part of the writing team and help change the, the direction? Because right now I think the weakest part of the WWE is the, the creative. Oh, man, I, I I wouldn't even you know, venture a guess because I, I I wouldn't say I'm not interested at all in creative, but I wouldn't want you know the pre the pressure of you know being the, the main guy because uh, you know in WWE you could never be the main guy anyway because everything eventually filters through Vince. I I would consider you know being a consultant, um, you know especially as I think I, I you know I have a good feeling for characters and and I think I could work with. Uh, with some of the younger guys, but I, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, my, I, I don't always have the right answers either. You know, I've been wrong in my own, uh, my own career, and and I've been wrong about talent. And I would hate to have other talents, you know, futures in my hands. Because the truth is, if I was calling the shots, I would have gotten rocked. <laughs> you know, I would have gotten rid of the rock during that. During that whole, uh, you know, rocking my Avia phase, uh, <laughs> so, so it's I, I don't know I I, I wouldn't entertain, even entertain the prospect because I don't feel like I'm qualified. Okay. Well, if you're not qualified now, I'm getting scared because I don't know too many people that would be more qualified. I'm qualified to be on the team. I just don't think I'd be qualified to. I, I've never done it. It's not like I you know grew up and uh, and booked territories and have any kind of a track record I could point to. I have a track record for creating characters, you know, that were interesting and, and, and you know, coming up with some really good ideas. Um, but, but you know, I, I, I used to, you know, have complete faith in guys like Eddie Gilbert. 
You know, even when you know, I had complete faith in uh, in Vince Russo, although he was a guy that you know I think needed a lot of um, you know reining in. But I still thought he had a lot of talent. I, I see Brian Gewertz, and I think he's kind of uh, you know <laughs> gets a hard deal with that. He's very talented. But I think you know, uh, you know, in WWE, when especially when you're trying to uh, you're, you're you're trying to um, to draw from such a huge audience from every region of the country and, and different age demographics, you probably do need a, a team uh, because one guy's vision probably isn't inclusive enough. Now, the one thing when you when you when you bring up you know Brian Gewertz, and this is you know not not necessarily knock on him, but on what a lot of people blame him for that probably is not his fault in that, you know, ultimately the way the shows are written is is what Vince McMahon wants and they're trying to do what Vince McMahon wants and, and also to entertain the people. But there are times, and, you know, when I, when I watch Raw, and it, it's the, the one emotion, is it's, it's the frustrating emotion because one of the things that, that you and I have talked about before, there's a time for comedy. Right. Um, and then certain characters, to me, you know, and I, I watched it on SmackDown Thursday with, with Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar and I, I enjoyed the Brock Lesnar Kurt Angle byplay, but I thought it was wrong because I thought that it should have been, you know, that stuff that Asian Christians could be doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's yeah. not. I mean, it's certainly not Brock Lesnar. I mean, Kurt Kurt's so versatile that he can do it, but I don't know if it's the wise thing for him. But whereas Brock, to me, Brock is an animal who should not be, you know, slapping, you know, drinking milk and cookies. You know? Yeah, I I didn't happen to see it on on Thursday, but but we talked a little bit before about how that's a major problem. How that you know the the uh, comedy drama athletic ratio is not always you know in right proportion. Here's just, here's just an example, and it's not. And I don't want to point to this. And say, wow, look what I did. But it's something you know. It's a minor thing, but but it, but it may have made a big difference. And and I think if guys would could could somehow get this balance right, it, it may you know on a larger level uh, change things. And I don't know what the hell that sentence just meant, but I'll give you the example. Is uh, Following the um, the uh, the interview we did with uh, Evolution, the one uh, with me and Randy Orton, uh, where uh, Flair and Triple H were a part of it, um, we had a pre-tape done, and it was a funny pre-tape, and it was the type of thing where you know uh, I, I ended up getting a good joke in on Al. You know, I said I was going to be in Maven's corner, and Al asked if there's anything he could do, and I said, Yeah, I'll probably be hungry. I about making me a couple sandwiches. <laughs> And it was funny, but you know what? We came out of that interview, and I mean, and, you know, when I was sweating and I was all fired up, and the whole pre-tape wasn't right, you know. So I, I kind of called an audible, and I said, "Can we do this live?" You know, it was like, and it was a lot of pressure, people running around, and 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 boom, we did it. And it was not by any means the greatest pre-tape in the world, and probably the funny one was a lot better if you're judging it just on its own basis. But in fitting in with the context of the show, the first one was all wrong, and the second one was much, much better. And and it's a hard thing to try to figure out what emotions are going to be like when, when the time comes. And maybe in that sense, you know, Brian, because he has not been, a, been you know, uh, one of the workers, has not been in the business that long, he might not know or not may not be able to guess that, whereas someone else would, but... You know that's that. Uh, you know, and and obviously that'd be a tough call to do everything live because it's enough pressure as it is. But you know, there are some times when when the, you know when you just cannot, uh, you just you know you can't predict the future and you shouldn't try to. Anything else? Eddie? Let me let me ask you one more quick question before I go. Um, you have you brought up uh, Vince Russo. Yes. And I was I was wondering. I've seen a, a tape of Beyond the Mat, a special edition that has some extra footage and. One of the footages is the day that the day you became dude love. Right, and right. All the backstage stuff. And my question is, is how hard is it to have a professional relationship with somebody who every other word is a cuss word? Was Vince cursing? He was cursing like a madman throughout the whole. You know what? You get so used to it. Uh, I think I even pointed out in, um, you know, in Have a Nice Day that like hearing somebody like a DDP go, you know, go over ideas for a match. You don't shoot somebody into the ropes. You shoot them into the effing ropes. You know, uh, you don't you don't give them an elbow. You give them a big effing elbow. That's just that's just the way people talk. You know, I, I stand out as being you know, it's like something wrong with me because I don't curse that often backstage. But uh, yeah, Russo lets the uh, f words fly quite a, quite a bit. I think. It, yeah, it's a shame that part got cut because that was really entertaining. I really thought I should have made the movie. You know, the thing the thing on that. When it comes to any of these, you know, movies and pieces like that that, that you see, 
Yeah, there's so many hours of footage that they're editing down to 90 minutes, or in some cases with news stories, 15 minutes. And it's just a shame because I'm sure that those people who do it are crying. Oh, man, this is so good. How can we take this out? But sooner or later, you got to get down to that length of time. Yeah, that's a, that's what Barry Blaustein said. He, you know, it was very difficult to get it down to the amount of time they wanted. And, uh, you know, there's so much there that you think could be used. And essentially, you know, uh, I mean, there could be whole other whole other documentaries made out of that footage. Yeah. Okay, guys, thanks for taking my call. Okay, thanks very much. You know, one thing that we, you know, you mentioned as, as, and somebody else mentioned as far as like inspiring and everything. You know, you you definitely were the inspiration for a ton of people who probably looked at all the guys on wrestling and just go, I could never be like that. But you, now I, I can. I can be like this. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. And I, you know, the thing is, I mean, it's good and it, it and it's bad. I mean, because because they saw one aspect of of what you did to get over, and in many cases they did not understand everything that you had done. You know, they just thought that it was the simplistic thing of, okay, if I don't have a good body, I can take a lot of pain, so therefore I'm going to build up my tolerance to pain. And again, like a lot of people in that, that I see coming into wrestling, it's like they. They're looking at the moves, but they're not looking at the, you know, the verbal ability and so many of these other things that, God, you just need. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, uh, I don't know if it's a positive thing um, because I think, you know, if they looked a little closer, they'd see, you know, that I, I really did have very good training. And, you know, I sacrificed a lot, you know, to be trained and gave up, you know, my whole social life as a, as a college student and, uh, you know, and uh, subsisted on <laughs> some pretty... Uh, you know, some pretty sparse, uh, uh, pretty bad hotel rooms and, and some pretty lousy food. Um, but yeah, I do think some people think, well, hey, he made it and he just, you know, ruined his body. That, and, and that's, that's one, you know, way of looking at it. And, and in a way, uh, you know, I look around the dressing rooms, you know, I just, I went, did one independent show and, uh, and I and I didn't want to do it. I was literally telling the guy on the phone. I was going, if you if you didn't advertise me and it's a get and it's a guaranteed show, you know why why bring me in? And the guy was like, no, we want you in. And and it just didn't make any sense, you know. And I said, I'm going to feel bad taking you know taking these people's money. And I'll tell you what, Dave. After the show, I didn't feel so bad taking the money because they really didn't. Not, these guys really hadn't taking the time to learn the business, you know, and, and I'm not that hard on new talent, but I just, I didn't see, uh, you know, anybody that, that had really studied and, and was trying to, you know, really become a, a season, a decent all-around performer. They were just running out, you know, move after move, and the crowd, you know, they, they can only take so many big moves before you have to give them some kind of a, you know, a, a story out there. Yeah. I'm going to Savannah, Georgia, and Jonathan. Jonathan, what's going on? Hey, what's going on, guys? Dave, I had a question for you and a question for Mick. Okay. Uh, my question for you, uh, it's, it'll probably be real quick, is um, where are they heading, if you know, with the Noble Nydia angle? I don't and, know. <laughs> I don't know. And um, I guess that's it then. And my question <laughs> for Mick was, um, if he had to pick, like, like maybe Todd, like five guys from the indie scene if he had his own let's say he had his own like federation or he could like he was Vince and he could sign guys or JR whoever does all that who would he pick I, got, I have to be honest with you I um, you know, I've got four kids <laughs> and I I just don't have the time or haven't you know made the time to to check out the indie scene and I'm kind of a uh, you know, embarrassed that I keep up with it, uh, you know, in the Observer, uh, and I would like to see some of the guys I read about, but uh, I, I just don't know the independent scene that well. Okay. That was, all right, sorry about that. That's fine. All right, that was it. Thanks. Okay, okay, Jonathan. You know, I want to ask you, you know, in your career, okay, of, of guys that you've worked with, I just want to make it of guys that you've worked with, okay? okay, because you're in the ring with them, you know how their pluses and minuses who do you think are the most physically, I don't want to say physically even talented, but the guys that you just, um, you know, like really respect their, whether it be physical ability, mental ability, all-around ability, um, you know, you don't have to limit it to any, like, number, just guys that right off the top of your head, just go, these guys are just total standouts of, of guys I've worked with. Well, yeah, I was lucky, you know, and that I had, uh, you know, so many great guys, uh, especially, you know, during the years I was with WWE, but even before that, you know, I mean, to, to be in there with, uh, you know, with Bobby Eaton, and, and, and I really enjoyed working with Sting, and I thought, you know, that program uh, d did a lot for me. Um, and then, you know, heading into 
WWF that you know without the the program of the Undertaker, the probably the whole Mankind character would have just you know fallen by the wayside. So I really enjoyed him and, and you know and the way that he he looked his outlook on the business and, and doing matches. And from there, you know, I had some great runs, not just great runs, but uh, but great matches and a lot of fun also working with. Uh, Working with Austin, working with Triple H, working with The Rock when he was a you know was a young heel, even though you know we had our share of differences, but uh, but I I think we also had a, a great time and, and did a lot of funny things later when we went on to team up. So there's uh, some of the guys, and of course you know Terry Funk was uh, you know was probably my my favorite all time guy to uh, work with. Although I didn't know I don't know why he didn't show up at the Garden. I, I was going to ask you about that. Like what what happened there? I don't. I got in touch with him, and uh, and I'm afraid to to find out why he wasn't there. I don't know if they didn't, if WWF didn't contact him, or if something uh, fell through. I don't know. It would have been nice to have had him there. Yeah. Let's go to Ben in Boca Raton. Ben, what's going on? Ben. Uh, that's not working. We're going to have to go to Jeff in Burlingame. Jeff. Hey, Dave. Good talking to you. Okay. What's going on? Hey, well, you just took my question about Terry Funk. <laughs> okay. About why he wasn't there? Yeah, well, that's part of it. Uh, the other one was, um, Nick, I was at the ECW arena the night Terry Funk caught on fire. Right, right. And I want to know if you can tell us what it was like in the dressing room that night. Oh, man. That was like the lowest point of my career, you know, uh, as, you know my, as, as, as far as my enthusiasm uh, for the business. Um, I thought, I really thought, you know, I didn't realize it was a towel that had flown off the chair uh, that was taped on. You know, was taped onto the chair and had flown off and landed on him. I thought, from my vantage point, that it was just a fireball that you know just ignited him. Uh, so, and I remember, you know, I, I think it was about three seconds you have before a flame really does its damage. And uh, and and I had written in my book. I said I don't know if I couldn't catch him or if I just you know kind of chickened out because I remember thinking I need to put out Terry. And then I remember thinking, how? You know, I don't know how to do it. And I don't know if I couldn't catch him or if everything just happened so quickly. But that towel uh, ended up, you know, dropping off of his body. And he was burned only in, uh, you know, one small part, but severely burned in that part. And when I got back to the dressing room, you know, he was just livid. He was throwing things, you know, that seemed well heavier than any human being should be able to throw. You know, just like flipping tables and furniture and and especially you know screaming at me and it was, you know, it was like having your dad yell at you know but <laughs> but much worse because I never actually set my dad on fire. <laughs> so, uh, my father never had that kind of reason to do that and then uh, you know uh, later on uh, that uh, that I guess that next day I don't, I didn't I didn't know that Terry went F, came back from the hospital and did prom promos for the next month. You know, I, I didn't know where he was. I remember driving home and thinking, you know, I, I'll never wrestle again. You know, and by the time I got home, it was I'll never wrestle again in this country. Like, I'd kind of changed the, the rules of my own, you know, self-imposed retirement. <laughs> uh, but the next day, I called his house to make sure that I'd be the first one, uh, you know, whose voice he heard. And uh, and then my wife and I went out for the day, and we came home. He had left a message. I remember it almost, you know, uh, you know verbatim where he said, Jack, this Jack, this is Terry Funk, and uh, I I act like a damn fool last night. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. But I'll tell you what, we sure gave him a lot to talk about in Japan. <laughs> and so it was. Uh, it really uh, you know made my day because you know that was a you know a terrible terrible occurrence. And then we were almost you know we were sued. Uh, the Funker and I. Uh, each spent six days in Philadelphia in court, and we were very, very lucky to come out of there, uh, you know, without paying a dime. Anything else, Jeff? No, thanks a lot, guys. Okay, you're very welcome. We're going to go to Prospect, Connecticut. Jeff, also. Jeff, what's going on? Hey, Nick, it's a pleasure talking to you. You're among my favorites of all time. Well, thank you. My first question, I just had a couple questions. My first question is kind of like the last one Dave asked, but the opposite. Who would you say off the top of your head is among the worst workers you've ever had to work with in ring talent? Why? <laughs> oh man, that's where I win a lot of friends. Uh, uh, you know, Mil Mastro is <laughs> I knew that was coming. Just be like a guy like an El Gigante. Uh, well, El Gigante, yeah, he was he was kind of uh, awkward, but I only had a couple of matches with him. Um, and uh, but uh, Mastro stands out because he was he was so famous, and because 
almost universally people hated working with him and they thought he was, you know, a, a, a real selfish worker, but he managed to stay over. Uh, he's standing out in my mind, and I, I don't know, probably that's something I'd have to think about for a while, but I'll, I'll go with Mascaris as the worst, most overrated, most selfish guy I've ever worked with. You know what's funny about him is that... Um... <laughs> Every, you know, every, everyone that you talk with um, that, that spent a lot of time around Mil Moscaris has, like, you know, the kind of like the, 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 the Mil Moscaris comedy about, you know, staying on sippy toes, sucking in his stomach and all that. Sure. And, 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 you know, just the impossibility of trying to work with him because he wouldn't give anyone anything. Right. Yet, at the same time, out of all of the wrestlers that ever wrestled, of all the Mexican wrestlers in history, from on a worldwide basis, nobody ever clicked like he did. I know, I know. I mean, like, I mean, I mean, you know, everywhere he went from New York to Japan. I mean, like, I mean, there were wrestlers as big in Mexico, but but when they got out of Mexico, none of them meant anything. Yeah, and I, that's something I can't explain because you'd think that a guy would have to have, you know, some, you know, I, he obviously had talent, but you'd think that uh, you know, having good matches and uh, and uh, you know, uh, being unselfish would be part of the, you know, would be would be part of the whole package. But for him, uh, it wasn't. And I don't, I don't know how he got to be that famous, but I just know that everybody who worked with him uh, hated it. <laughs> My second question was, what happens when you're going into a match, like you're in a match with like a Mill Mascaris or even like maybe a few of your matches with The Undertaker, and you're realizing that this match is just like so horrible and there's nothing you could possibly do to, to get, make it any better? What, what do you do in a situation like that? Oh, man. You know what? I used to fight it. Uh, you know, I used to think I could do, uh, you know, you know, salvage almost anything and the one that sticks out in my mind is the one i just kind of gave up on was that that tag team match that just seemed to go on forever with me and sullivan against uh i can't remember offhand who it was but it was my last pay-per-view not my last one it was like that the one where i had the bad back um july of of, of 94 i think uh it was rome was it roma and orndorff I can't, I can't I don't remember. I can't remember the match. I think so. Pretty wonderful, yeah. Yeah, yeah pretty wonderful. It just went on forever. And, uh, you know, I was really fearing for my, you know, my health. And, uh, you know, I wasn't really supposed to be out there. And and, and uh, I think I said in my book that I was on the, uh, you know, on the on the ring apron thinking, I can save it, I can save it. And then I just kind of waited until that feeling went away. And <laughs> that was the one time I remember, you know, the match just being dreadful and, and not really caring. There were other times I, I did try. I mean, there was the Nikolai Volkov match, you know, where, you know, obviously I couldn't solve that riddle and <laughs> I'd have a drag a good match out of Nikolai. I've been in my share of stinkers, believe me, uh, you know, uh, and some of them, you know, you look back on it, you just kind of laugh. There was one where, you know, Kerry Von Erich had a new girlfriend in the front row and was just trying his best to impress her at, you know, <laughs> meant, you know, participating in, the, you know, one of the worst matches of all time. <laughs> My last question, really quick. What do you remember about the, the match you had in WCW and the electric chair match at Halloween Havoc? Oh, <laughs> somebody, I was just reminiscing about it with a fan in England because they had the videotape. Uh, you know what? It didn't strike me that we were having that bad of a match at the time. You know, there was so much going on. I think if you looked at it, it really wasn't that bad. It was just that the premise was kind of ridiculous. And, and you know, when the on-off switch to the... Uh, you know, the electric chair was was on and, and nothing happened. And I think, you know, at one point we had to pretend that it will, you know it, it hadn't stopped working. Uh, it, it was it was a big mess. But uh, I think Abdullah's performance in the chair. <laughs> well, that made it memorable. Yeah, it was, it was what everyone remembers. <laughs> he was he was really selling it. Uh, but it was, you know, I've had like I said, I've had a lot of really really bad matches, but I don't consider that one to be in that league. What else you mean? You're kind of in an interesting, um, you know, traveling in kind of literary worlds right now. Um, but as a wrestler, um, have, is there any thing that stands out in your mind, whether it be a, a, a media piece on you or, or, a, or, or say, a reporter that you've dealt with on a radio show or something, where you just, like, it was one of those things where no matter what you did, you realized you were doomed because you were a wrestler and you know uh, any more than others or not ne never um you know i it, i didn't actually get that feeling um you know when when i was doing it like the for example the second 2020 piece that's funny that was exactly what i was going to bring up next yeah i mean <laughs> i had no idea that they were going to go with that really you know um kind of you know depressing uh, angle 
because I didn't I didn't think of the end of my career as being depressing. I thought of it as being you know kind of a you know a happy time. You know, especially when I got like the second lease on life. Um, you know, unfortunately, due to Austin's injury, I was able to go out you know with a couple of big matches uh, on top. But that was you know one thing uh, where they just you know were going to you know they they had their story in mind. I think. And I think that's what a lot of journalists do. Um, I didn't see the piece, you know, on uh, on real sports, but um, and I wanted to see it, but I just wasn't in a place that got home box office at the time. But from what I was told, they just kept asking Vince that question over and over, and I think they knew based on, you know, his his uh, his performance on Costas that he would he would react um, aggressively to it. And it's like, you know, how many times can you answer the same question before it gets annoying? And and I think you know there are a lot of journalists that do that. They they make up their story and then they just set about finding the quotes that will will back it up. And uh, you know obviously if you talk to somebody for four hours and then they end up taking you know three three quotes from you, you know they're they, they're going to get what they want. And uh, and that's unfortunately the case. But I don't remember thinking oh this this well, oh, well there was one time and of all things it was my local newspaper. You know, and it was a book signing in Stony Brook, New York, where I grew up, and and I thought, okay, well, this obviously is just you know local, local kid does you know writes book, and the woman just started lobbing all these accusations out at me, and uh, I felt strong enough to write a pretty a pretty uh, uh, vehement letter uh, to the editor, and apparently that among other things cost her her job because I did point out you know how how little uh, you know research she did and how you know she me. said about. Oh, sorry, Dave. We gotta go. All right. I want to thank you very much. We'll see you all next week. Sounds good. Who got, would have gotten the blame had the show done poorly and uh, decided, I guess, that he thought the blame was unfair and the payoff was unfair. So maybe Hogan knew something about vengeance or had some predictions. <laughs> I guess so. As official as it's going to be this, you know, this far in advance, it looks like we're going to get Triple H and Bill Goldberg as the main event at SummerSlam in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and I believe it's August. 24th, although that date might be wrong, but it's uh, uh, actually, it, the date isn't wrong. That is the date. Okay. So anyway, um, that's going to be a very interesting match because it's a match that neither guy, there's, there, there are great arguments on why both guys should win and why both guys should lose. And, uh, and in how long? And in how long? And... Um, Boy, that's good. I just think that the week before and the day of that show and the day after that show are going to be very interesting. Oh, I think that between now and August, it's going to be very interesting because, uh, I mean, whether or not, you know, let's, let's just say the main event is, is for sure. And it, 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 it's not for sure this, this time out, you know, this far out, yeah. because Vince McMahon changes his, his, his uh, direction on a dime regularly. But assuming that he made mention of it tomorrow... Uh, that would leave two months for every game in the world to be played. Well, it's uh, going to be played whether he announces it or not because people people are aware of it now. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that'll be fun to watch on TV because, uh, you know, whether they announce the match or not, the one thing that, like you said, will not be certain until the day of the show is who's going over. So uh, No, even done. even if even if we hear a week before, it will not be certain it until... Nothing. It will mean nothing. That's right, because there's going to be games yeah. played until the very end. Uh, Randy Couture and Tito Ortiz have a unification match for the... UFC Light Heavyweight Championship that's going to be on September 26th in Las Vegas. They had a press conference this week, on Wednesday, and at the press conference they, in fact, did not announce a building or where or when tickets would be on sale, but uh, they did announce the match, and I guess they just wanted that out uh, as quick as they could because it was, um, I guess, the day yeah, after. There, the there day, are many buildings bidding for it. Maybe there are. I don't know. <laughs> that is a really intriguing match, and it's a really hard one to pick, not at, like, <laughs> not, not like every UFC match isn't hard to pick, but boy, this one's really hard to pick. You know, the thing is, I always, I always don't pick Randy, and Randy always uh, amazes me. And Randy, amazes Randy me. always wins when he's the underdog. Now he's yeah, the underdog I'm again in this one. Here, I'm thinking about this match, and I, I'm just right now. My pick would be Tito. You know, if they were both 28 years old, I might pick as Randy for sure. Um, Randy's 40. Then again, he hasn't looked 40 in a lot of his fights. No, he has not. And um, he certainly didn't in his last fight. That is his car that I just loved. 
Oh, yeah. I, 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 he's looking so sad at the jury's lying on this broken windshield. And then he goes and, and looks at him off. Yeah. My car. <laughs> my, that was great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess that means we're going to get some Eddie, Eddie Guerrero and jury matches. Yep. So, and I don't know where they go from there, but uh, I guess we will find out. Chava will be back. Not that soon. Not till September. Well, the rates are going with one pay-per-view, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, at, the, at the house shows, they were hooking Eddie with uh, Sean O'Hare. So, he's, so uh, I mean, at least that's, that's what I saw over the weekend, so we'll see where that goes. See, the thing I don't understand, I, I always look at the house shows, and I just look at how I had to try to learn how to wrestle, and that was to be in a ring with someone who knew what they were doing. And I just look at these house show lineups, and it'll be like Maven will be in the ring with Mark Jindrak or something like that, and... Or they'll take someone and they'll team them with somebody who's experienced. And I would think, okay, why don't you have them wrestle with the person who's experienced? It should be Eddie Guerrero versus Sean O'Hare every single night for, like, uh, six months. And then Sean O'Hare will be good. It's not Sean O'Hare teaming with Eddie and facing, like, Mark Jindrak and Maven or whoever. Well, I don't know that we'll do that, especially because they're on different rosters. But uh, I, but I do know what you're saying. You just got to work against good guys. And I always see these tough enough guys wrestling tough enough guys, and I don't understand it. Yeah. Uh, my, my figure four story of the week is last week you were talking to me about feeling bad about uh, when I read it. And, of course, I told you that, you know, oh, it's no big deal. Things like that never happen. And so guess what happened yesterday when the mail came? And everybody's in a bad mood at the house. And I come back from the, from the uh, post office and I got my figure four and I sit down and everyone's yelling and screaming. And I just tune it out and I start reading about your article about um, Jamal being fired which is a spoof of, of Jamal being fired. It's not like we're making fun of that 350-pound man being fired. Um, but it was, he wrote a really funny story about it, and I'm just cracking up, and people were not amused by the fact that I was having a good time when nobody else was having a good time. And Oops. So. Maybe I should send five. <laughs> what? Maybe I should send five issues, one for everybody. <laughs> she probably should. What, for the dogs, too? I yeah. that many people living in the house. All right. I did get uh, a couple of orders the other day, and I noticed that they were, like, from three people in the same home. All ordering? I never get anybody like that. I was very amazed by that one, so. I would be, too. <laughs> whatever, whatever works for you. Yes. Anyway, we are going to go to uh, Mike in Kelowna, British Columbia, which I think is going to have a SmackDown taping next month, correct? Yeah, we sure are. First one ever. Yeah. Now, you had, you, it was Nitro or Thunder that was there? Uh, we had a Nitro. First match on Thursday, anyway. I mean, first match that WWE fans would have seen. Um, when I first heard that it was going to be that particular match, I thought, this is the most horrible idea I've ever heard of in my whole life. But I think that the way that it ended on TV, I almost think that it was a success. So I think it was a success, but on the wrong night. They should not have yeah. done that match on a night where, they, where you know that the audience is going to be low because they spent all these months building up this guy's debut. And they do it on a night where, you know, it's probably one of the lowest, you know, and, I, and the final rating is not, but I would assume it's going to be one of the five lowest rated SmackDowns in history. Yeah. And it's not the fault of the main event. It's the fault of the night. Yeah. And, and of all the, uh, you know, of all the matches they could have booked him in, this was pretty much a miracle the way it turned out. Yeah, it was put together real well. I love that one where um, Big Show and all of his plumptitude, I, I, don't, I don't think there's such a word, but... Um, there is now. Yes. So, you know, went up to Stephanie McMahon and, and made her look just... So small and thin. I thought that exact same thing. I mean, he looked so huge and fat as he was doing that ogre thing on Stephanie McMahon, and and she's doing that. <laughs> that was yeah. that was tremendous, though. I could not help but think that she had to have written that whole segment right there, where I'll be in a hall and Big Show will obscure the entire hall. Because <laughs> everyone's always talked about, God, Stephanie looks so big, and also they do this angle and she looks like just tiny, just tiny woman. Yes. <laughs> Man of the big show. <laughs> oh, my God. And so she actually knows the lesson of size that no one else in the company does. Obviously, Vince Russo didn't on Wednesday. That's true. Yeah. Uh, Kane, uh, bald head, no, uh, exactly. no more burns. I, I take back everything I wrote about uh, how this could possibly be success. <laughs> he was so less terrifying with the shaved head, and, yeah, it, he's doomed. Yeah, the other thing on the, on, the, on the WWE, remember a couple weeks ago we were praising them? About how the, um, you know, like the week that they had the two Madison Square Garden shows, how they had the lineups in advance, and, you know, everything was, was you know, so well built up. And now here yeah. we are in uh, Montreal and Toronto this week for uh, Raw and SmackDown, and we don't know anything. 
Nothing. Yeah, nothing's been nothing's been said whatsoever. Although uh, Eric Bischoff will not be there tomorrow, and uh, Steve Austin will be back tomorrow, and I guess it's Steve Austin's revenge. That's that's like you know I hate those kind of things where they do that one week and then the other one the other week. You know they yeah. used to do that in the past. I never liked it. I didn't particularly like Raw. I thought SmackDown ended up being all right, kind of slow at the beginning. Um, the tag team title change where uh, Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas beat Eddie Guerrero and Tajiri. That was that was a really good match. Yeah. And the the final segment, you know, I mean, for what it was, I thought it was a successful. I thought it was a successful segment. The place went crazy. So the show ended on a good note. The last half hour, forty five minutes were all right. Uh, it was kind of boring up until that point. There's something about the angle where Eddie was upset because of... It's a really tough one to pick. Um, you know, Tito's been doing a movie, so, I mean, as, as, as much training as he can probably do, you know, Randy's probably trained harder, although the last, you know, the training in the last six weeks is really what counts, and Tito will train incredibly hard. Um, t- you know, Tito's younger, Randy's got more guts, and in a tough fight, the guy with more guts, uh, you know... Um, yeah. You know, has has the edge in that Tito doesn't like to. Neither nobody likes to get hit, but Tito folds quicker. Now, Tito, again, but again, Tito is younger, and Tito is a really skilled fighter. And, yeah. and uh, it's a boy, it's a tough one. And and go ahead. I'll go ahead. Okay. Well, you know, and and the size. The, the whole thing is is that Ortiz has been used to being kind of. Um, I guess the, the strong guy in every match he's been in, he's been the be- he's never faced a wrestler of the caliber of Randy Couture. Um, you know, he's faced um, he's faced kickboxers and, and punchers much better, but in every case he's managed to take them off their feet and keep them there, which meant that their kickboxing meant nothing. Uh, with Randy Couture, there's a question on who's going to get the takedowns, um, and they're going to have to fight for them. Whoever's going to get them, standing up, um, Tito I think is quicker. But he doesn't like to get hit, and you know, Randy out out boxed Chuck Liddell, who Cheeto was afraid of. So it's again, it's, it's, well, we'll have a lot to say about that one as the weeks go on. Yeah, the one thing when I listened to the press conference was uh, I was listening to Tito, and everybody who asked him a question was asking about ducking Chuck Liddell and everything like that. And we've obviously been following that for months and months now, and I think pretty much everybody assumed that he was. But Tito did such a good job. That I almost believed his entire story. The first he was Except that it wasn't true. And then he had <laughs> commitments. And then he was, couldn't train because he was filming for this movie. And he was so good that I was like, wow, he's making a strong case. Yeah, but you know what really, you know what really killed it was when, um, I think it was Jeff Merrick, actually, who asked about uh, the comment about uh, maybe we're going to take that match to Japan. And then yeah. they were trying to say, oh, well, they meant that you know UFC was going to do a show in Japan headlined yeah, by that. Yeah. When I heard that, it was just like, oh, okay, you guys, you're, you're, now you're insulting my intelligence, and you've gone too far. Yeah. So. Uh, and I think that they knew that Jeff knew because they were really, they didn't sound like they wanted to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't At think all. they wanted to talk to anyone. That was that was kind of embarrassing as a press conference. I mean, as far as like, because all the questions, you know, is for, for this for Cheeto were all about Chuck Liddell. Yeah, it was almost like the Linda McMahon conference when that one guy called in and they immediately got rid of him. But it was like an entire call full of that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We we avoid it. Yes. Um, what do you think of Zach Allen's debut on Thursday? How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer, and we got Brian Alvarez here as well. And uh, we're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling here on Wrestling Observer Live. Mick Foley will be joining us in about a half an hour, and uh, we can talk about his book, Tatum Brown, talk about... The WWE, when he's going to be back on television, how his tour was. He just got back from the U.K., as a matter of fact. And uh, actually, I'm almost done with his book, and I've got a lot of questions for him on that. But mainly, it's going to be you guys calling, because the last time he was on, uh, we had so many questions that we took up almost the whole show. So this time, it's going to be uh, you guys calling up for Mick Foley. You can call us at 1-800-878-PLAY, but all lines are busy right now. Brian, how are you doing? Uh, I'm here. <laughs> what does that mean? I... Uh... In the introduction, so I almost didn't make it. Wow, wow. So how's your week? Got us lost. Oh, oh, so now, are you at, where are you at tonight? I'm at the Elks Lodge again. Milwaukee, the Oregon? Monthly, uh, yeah, the monthly show here. Okay. So, him. Yeah. Oh. He made it. Oh, that's good. Um, Hulk Hogan's no longer in the WWE, at least for a little while. Yep, yep. Uh, what was your reaction when you uh, heard that news? My reaction was, I remember when they first started doing the Mr. America thing, I liked it so much because it was so campy 
and I really enjoyed a lot of what they did with it. And then, like, he was gone, and it's all over, and they did an angle to wrap it up on uh, Thursday night on SmackDown, and it was like, okay. Well, that was a weak finish, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, all that build, and that was the end. He unmasked. Yeah. He got fired. Yeah. But what can you do, you know? Yeah, and uh, Roddy Piper, also gone? Yep. Yeah, in the same week. I don't, actually, I think that that's the best for all concerned anyway. Um, yeah. And Hogan's going to end up being back, and I think everyone knows that anyway. Yeah, and I think we talked a lot last week about Piper and how I'm sure he knew he was done, and probably uh, Hogan had a pretty good idea as well from uh, some of his interviews leading up to uh, that announcement. So You know, Hogan, I, the, one, the one, one thing about Hogan that has come across as far as internally in the company, um, as far as uh, with a couple of the wrestlers and everything, and not just wrestlers, but people in the office, um, it, it really hurt his, this, this leaving hurt his rep in the sense that he, you know, left over among, you know, the, the prime thing, the, the complaint about the payoff. And it's yeah. like every wrestler in that company knows that he got paid a whole lot more than they did with maybe, oh, yeah. with maybe like the exception of Vince McMahon and maybe Kurt Angle, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and he's out there, you know, it, it kind of, you know, he's, he's booked for all these things and, and he's agreed to stay at least through SummerSlam. And he doesn't like a payoff on a show that everyone knows, you know, did well below expectations. And he decides to leave. And he was the main event. He was the guy who, you know, was the guy who would would have been credited had that show done well. And 